our community and we'll we'll let you get back to the day job. So appreciate Great. it. We'll talk soon. Thank Thanks. you guys. All right, we'll keep the ball rolling uh, today. Um, so we have Lauren Campbell, the e-commerce marketing lead for Ferrera Candy Company, and Nobles Crawford, the content strategy manager at manager at RB, uh, joining us and uh, for a conversation moderated by Adrian Lahens. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. The chief operating officer at Influential. Uh, how are you guys all doing? Hanging in there. How are you? Uh, you know, it's it's been crazy, but uh, we appreciate you spending time with us today, and and hopefully we'll have a, a great conversation. So, uh, Nobles, thank you for being here. I see Adrian and Lauren are on, but muted. Um, so we'll just give it a second and wait for them. We uh, are. Right. Can you hear me? Yeah, there you are. And I think Hi. Lauren is getting on the platform in just a second. It looks like. Um, where are you guys uh, dialing in from? I'm in Manhattan, New York. Yeah, and I'm in LA, and Lauren also is in LA. Got it. Okay. Well, welcome to you all. Um, it's a, a pleasure to have you, as I mentioned. And uh, so, uh, Lauren, I'll just uh, I'll kick it over to you guys, Adrian, Lauren, Nobles. Thank you so much for joining us. As uh, I do, I'll bow out yeah. now and, and turn the virtual stage over to you guys. Awesome. Thanks so much, guys. I'm, I'm, it's great to be here. And I'm really excited because Lauren and Nobles both represent two of my very favorite products right now, <laughs> the Lysol and chocolate. I mean, how could you possibly go wrong? Um, so to introduce the panelists, Lauren joins us um, from Los Angeles. As I mentioned, she has 20 years of experience in the CPG space. She's worked across products on Nestle, um, and she's now managing retail marketing at Ferrero USA, which covers Butterfinger, Crunch, and Baby Ruth. And Nobles joins us from New York City. He's been in the field for over a decade, um, and he's certainly left his mark on many culture for forward brands, um, including HBO, Samsung, Craft, ABC, and currently at Lysol. So we all connected yesterday, had a really great conversation. Um, something that kind of brings us all together um, is that we are all parents. Uh, we are marketers and we're working from home. So wanted to understand from you guys, how have you, uh, how have your teams personally adjusted uh, to this new reality? What is your company's plan look like in terms of reopening the office? And how have you managed working from home while parenting? I really need some tips. <laughs> now, both you want to kick it off? Ladies first, go for it, Lauren. <laughs> so um, it's interesting for sure. It's a, a big adjustment I had because um, we were in the process of transitioning the business from Los Angeles back to New Jersey. I was already working remotely as of January. However, at that point, I had my three teens in school. Um, so the big change was not so much for me working, but having a house full of three teenagers. Um, so it's been a huge change. We, um, I would say Ferrero as a company has sort of not been um, really focused on remote working. And so this has been a huge shift for, for everyone. And um, I think we still have not heard about the plan for an office reopening. So it's sort of, it, it's an interesting uh, intermediate right now between, you know, figuring that out. But as a parent, um, my kids are pretty occupied with their, you know, I'm definitely on a lot of Zoom calls with two-year-olds lately, um, you know, for the, the parents that I, I think it's a lot more challenging for parents of, of young kids um, than, than older children. And, uh, and, and for us over at wreck -It, um, so, so wreck -It obviously is a global company and what really benefits us is that we have a lot of scientists that work for us because we're in the you know, business of chemicals here. Uh, and so in, in health. Uh, and so when it comes to, uh, you know, how our office is going to be reopening, uh, our leadership, our CEO, global CEO, all the way down. Is certainly taking a cue um, from the professionals that work with us and and also the CDC who we partner with a lot um, on many different projects as to how to do it safely uh, for us here in the US there hasn't really been a date. Um, they are saying that they're going to be you know phasing on a limited basis uh, the amount of people that are able to go to the office now this is for our, our our marketing office our supply team is still going in and they're they're honestly the heroes in all of this making all of the the products that people are using now to protect themselves. Um, but for like the, the marketing office um, in Parsippany, 
it's going to be a phased roll in. Um, and, you know, and we just don't know when that's going to start yet. From a culture perspective, we've adapted to, to virtual um, co working pretty well. Um, you know, and I wouldn't even say it was a rocky start in the beginning. Uh, it, we, uh, even though we're usually very central in the, in the New Jersey office, uh, we still are on IM a lot. And so, you know, just bringing it to the video conference was just another step that that was pretty, you know, organic to our our current office behavior. Me personally, I'm definitely um, I'm a Gemini. I have to be in front of somebody, you know, talking to them. I do a lot of desk drop bys, you know, in my day in my day to day because um, I'm across all of the brands on hygiene. Um, and uh, and it's been a little bit difficult for me. So I've been using my cell phone and video conferencing a lot in tandem um, to get like fast answers or to push quick approvals. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I'm getting used to it and I remain hopeful that I'll see my colleagues in the future soon, hopefully. <laughs> awesome. And how have you been dealing with, uh, working with kids? Oh, right. So I have a four and a two year old. Uh, and the reason why I didn't raise them is because I got them back into daycare this week. Um, and, uh, a lot of precautions with the daycare, but certainly worth it, worth it. My wife is a lawyer. So we have, you know, two very high intensity jobs and we, we took quarantine very seriously for three months. And so, you know, now that there was a procedure for daycare and they're there, uh, I took the rest of the week off so I can finally just decompress from everything that's going on and just kind of focus on some self-care this week. Awesome. That's very needed. Very needed. Um, I think that's an important part is that I think that the days off because people aren't going anywhere right. in general is a hard concept to work in right now. And so I think that is an important piece to stay focused on is that we do need that time to sort of reset. Yeah, that's a really great point. I mean, what are you guys doing from a self-care perspective? A lot of golf, a lot of golf. Right. <laughs> it's the it's the social distancing sport of 2020. Everyone should start playing golf. Yeah. <laughs> Were you a golfer beforehand? I was, yeah, yeah. And now it just gives me more of an excuse to exercise and just be in the middle of nature. Awesome. Yeah, lots of home workouts and huge walks has been in, in this house. <laughs> Great. Um, so yeah, both cleaning products and CPG food items have certainly been in very, very high demand in the light of the pandemic and newfound time at home. Uh, how have you guys been handling supply chain issues, especially on the Lysol side from a social marketing perspective? And really, what is the forward looking strategy as we head into the flu season and also the holidays later this this year? Yeah, thank you for asking about supply. That is like the number one, um, not only internal conversation, but also, you know, consumer conversation going on right now. Um, it's changed a lot of things. You know, it's, we had the, we had the, the benefit of, you know, Dettol, you know, being in uh, other countries and Dettol is basically the Lysol because Lysol is really only sold in Canada, Germany, and here in the US. Dettol is the, the more like global ubiquitous brand. And they saw this coming. Uh, and so they were able to really like the, the Dettol marketing client and the supply side were able to at least give us a heads up like guys, this is serious. It's coming your way like around early February. So I know that plans for supply started taking place, but when it hit, you know, United States and, you know, most of the people started taking it serious. We were certainly no one could be prepared for that um, demand shot through the roof, as you know. And so how we coordinate with our supply team on the marketing end of things um, is so much tighter than before. Uh, our, our media budget, uh, starting back in late February was beholden, you know, completely beholden to supply because we don't want to have to, you know, we don't want to drive up demand. If you can't even find it on your shelves, it's just a, a bad brand, you know, perception. Um, so instead we focused our comms on, you know, really kind of coming to, well, we've always been a thought leader in the germs and, and uh, the harmful germs and bacteria protection space. But we've really kind of come into our own now about how we're able to disseminate that information to a consumer base that might not be, you know, as technical because they're, they just got introduced to what like disinfection actually is. And so we've had to kind of evolve the way that we talk about our product, not necessarily in, in service of the product, but in service of how do we organically fit into your story now that you can't find our product. So we're still giving you the benefit of, you know, our thought leadership. And that's the way our social comms is going now, really focused on education. That makes sense. And are there any uh, particular platforms that you're leaning into more than others? Well, definitely Facebook. I mean, to be quite honest, Reckit hasn't really in the past focused a lot on our own social platforms until about a year and a half ago, a year ago. 
Um, and so, and so now that we're starting to build content specifically for our own platforms, um, Facebook was always, you know, our, our main place of record for Lysol because, you know, women between the ages of, you know, 25 to 54, they're, you know, in a high degree. So that's our, our number one place. Um, but outside of that, we're starting to venture a little bit more into Twitter. Um, just, you know, we, because, you know, when, uh, when, when the president talked about, you know, the whole, you know, inject bleach into your veins kind of a thing. The conversation was happening faster than Facebook would allow. So we started to dive into Twitter a little bit more um, to, you know, really kind of not only protect our company, but also the people that use our product to make sure it's like use as directed, use as directed. And I say it a third time, use as directed. Um, but, uh, but we're starting to dive a little bit more into Twitter for that timely conversation. Yeah, while we're on that topic, I mean, from, you know, major retailers to the auto industry, really Trump in his press briefings kind of highlighted a lot of brands and, of course, then made that statement um, that, you know, kind of went wild. Um, how how was that like internally at the company kind of dealing with that? You know, what 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 did you guys do to kind of, uh, you know, kick into effect to address that? I'm sure it was quite a PR um, yeah. there internally. You know, it's funny, it's I, I kind of jump from crisis to crisis with companies I work for, like I was at Samsung working on Galaxy 7. And you know, now I was here for this. It's really quite interesting. Um, RB performed extremely admirable, admirably. And I've seen a lot of things, you know, in, in different parts of my career. And RB was so fast on this. Um, you know, it, it, the response started to take shape while we were sleeping with some of our global PR teams and they they were able to get some things to us in the morning. Meanwhile, like in different pods, basically uh, on the Lysol RB side, we started me having meetings and making like very quick decisions and actions with our creative agencies, with our media agencies um, as to how we're going to uh, not necessarily counter what he says, because we wanted to just make sure everyone had the information, the right information to, you know, decide to, again, use as directed, um, but also not come across in a fear mongery way and still have, you know, some, you know, some empathy in it. Uh, because it's, it's one thing to broadcast to tell someone not to do something, but it's another thing to, you know, teach them how to fish and help their critical thinking skills should this happen again. And that's really what we wanted to focus on uh, when it came to our comms. And, and I was like right on the front line of that. And that was, it was such a great experience and, and RB took care of it really first class and top notch. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, congratulations for that because you guys absolutely handled that super, super well. Um, Lauren, on, on your end, have there been supply chain issues in the chocolate category? Can you talk <laughs> a little bit about what that looks like? I know they're, sure. in, they're in high demand in my pantry, that's for sure. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> <laughs> that's great to hear. Um, there really have been some challenges. I think the immediate challenge was really just adapting to how consumers would shop and understanding, you know, grocery pickup, the huge surge there, the surge at Amazon, and the challenges in, in making sure it wasn't just because those supply chains are different in certain cases of where, you know, to position product. I think the next step was really understanding um, how to assess future going. And I think obviously we, we have really advanced analytics that help us position product, but there's like a huge unknown factor now that it, how long is this gonna last? How is it gonna continue to impact habits? Where are people gonna be shopping? And for our business specifically, understanding Halloween is, is the huge one. I mean, that's really what we're living right now is trying to understand Halloween because we're relying on retail forecast for production, and those are shifting by the minute as they get bullish or bearish on where we might be. And so I would say that, um, to your point, Noble's like the supply chain is, is doing an incredible job in trying to adapt the most um, because the shifts and the uncertainty, which is, you know, what they're trying to mitigate is, is really accelerated right now. Um, so we're definitely seeing huge shifts in retail accounts going cutting and then and then not just going back to where they started but going above and 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 trying to sort of ride this and i think that's been the biggest challenge for us and and then for on our side understanding how do you where do you position whose sub, you know orders do you stick with um i think that's that's an additional challenge where they've had to work very closely with the sales team um so we definitely are seeing that where 
we're seeing, you know, I don't work specifically on the Nutella business, but that's a big part of our business. And, um, you know, that was identified as sort of like a critical item um, by many of the retail accounts. So, um, you know, seeing how they are having to adjust to, again, like Lysol being a critical item, certain elements being critical and then others not, but consumers not necessarily aligning with that. Some people would say chocolate is critical right now. It's like the one thing that, that makes their day better, right? Especially if they, they're not wanting to drink every day. Yeah, absolutely. And from a, from a summer baking perspective, can you tell us a little bit about your campaign and how you're integrating that with social? For sure. Um, you know, I read this interesting article about baking going into this program. So we're having a summer baking program because we know parents especially are home right now looking for things to do with their kids. There's a surge, as we've all seen, whether it's sourdough bread or different types of activities online. And so when we um, spoke to our agencies uh, about we're, we're doing a, a big summer influencer baking campaign, we really wanted the recipes to be attainable and real. And so we weren't looking for influencers that make the perfect 27 step chocolate ganache with 17 different fillings, you know, for a cake that a consumer might look at and say, wow, that's really beautiful, but now I'm going to feel even worse, you know, in the same way that social can kind of have that boost, that positive reaction or can make you sort of feel bad about yourself. I think the brands need to think about that same relationship and, and how aspirational you want to be. So what we really asked for was looking for influencers that were, you know, whether it's hacks or kind of simple ideas that something our consumers could relate to, could make and then feel good about as opposed to feeling like it's a failure. So that's how we're moving into our program is really looking for ways to bring a tool for parents to feel good about their experience in the kitchen and with their kids. That's awesome. And it sounds like you're really looking for that sort of everyday influencer versus the, you know, aspirational type influencer. That's definitely the direction we gave in how we're selecting our influencers is looking you know, not only are we trying to make sure, I mean, we're obviously, and we can talk about this in a very politicized time. So, you know, that's one factor that we certainly look at with our influencers is, is that's not something we want to delve into in, in our baking. Yeah. Um, but, you know, so that, but then also looking at, at realistic representation of parenting, of life, and of recipes, because, um, perfection, I think, isn't what the brand should be really striving for right now, because I, I don't know that that is something that, that connects with consumers. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And, um, you know, especially since you brought it up in terms of brands and, and politics and kind of current events, um, you know, there's, there's uh, certainly some brands that do take a stand on social issues, right? It's really core to their DNA. Nike, of course, has done an incredible job. Ben and Jerry's Patagonia, yes. to name a few. Um, what is your guys' perspective on the role of brands during this time? Um, and, you know, especially for the brands who aren't wanting to necessarily engage in some of the conversations, uh, what is your advice to those brands so that they, you know, they don't get it wrong? Um, so for us, you know, at, at RB, um, it's, it's specifically on Lysol, who's having this, you know, timely conversation right now. Uh, the way that we kind of navigate these waters right now is we, we only want to talk about the things that we can actually, you know, give a benefit to our, you know, consumer base's lives um, or the folks that are even just exposed to our mesh's lives with. We don't, you know, as a science brand, basically, if you really want to break it down, you know, Lysol, we don't necessarily have a leg to stand on from a cultural conversation um, as is going on right now, you know, with our social, uh, uh, societal strifes. But we definitely have a leg to stand on when it comes to talking about protection against COVID. And even though right now our attention is not fully on COVID, you know, anymore, as we get through some of these other issues that, we're, that are going on right now, COVID's coming back. And so we can continue to talk about that. And yeah, there are some societal things that come into the COVID conversation, 
Um, but as long as, you know, we're laser focused on, you know, giving the educational benefit, you know, in the COVID conversation, we can see where that kind of takes us. But anything outside of that, we don't usually want to touch, um, uh, even though we can be sensitive to it. Um, so, for instance, like uh, during Blackout Tuesday, we pulled all of our social ads across the board down um, just because, you know, we didn't we couldn't make a statement because we don't feel like we have the leg to stand on there again. But we can at least show support in other ways. And, and that's how we ended up doing it. Um, but uh, but yeah, we'll, we only talk about things that we can give a, an identifiable educational benefit to the consumer. Yeah. You know, and I think it's um, to your point about certain brands having it in their DNA. If this is a time that really aligns well with the DNA or the brand identity that you have, I think it makes sense for you to continue to speak about it because it doesn't feel inorganic or inauthentic. I think what's challenging is if this is not in your brand DNA, if you, if you really haven't delved into these topics before, to hop in at this time can really go the wrong way. And I think what we spoke about is, you know, you can, there's a difference between being silent and listening, right? And so I think if you're just silent, that's one thing, but if you're sort of conveying that you're listening or you're respecting, there's different ways that I think you can kind of edge through this time that's appropriate. Um, for us, we haven't had a very politicized uh, brand DNA in our confectionery business, so it didn't feel like an appropriate time to delve in to that conversation. Um, at the same time, we don't want to be overtly speaking about COVID concerns because, again, that's not an area we're not helping the situation, but we do recognize that people are home and that we want to make sure they have availability to the products in different ways they shop. So it's, I think it's just connecting with consumers and, the, and trying to be consistent um, as much as you can is important. Yeah, such a great point. And how, how do you demonstrate that you're listening as a brand? What does that look like? Well, I think it can be in how you engage in social. Um, so the way that you respond to consumers' comments um, and the guidance you give there and the conversations that you have. It doesn't have to be that, that you're taking a stand, but really that you want to hear, you want to converse, you want to learn. I think that's a way that you can really start to engage on one-on-one -on -one relationships in, in your social management. So that is a benefit um, if you're looking to have that. Makes sense. So, you know, these past really few years, and especially, of course, the, the current events of today, have really shed great light on the need for diversity and inclusion across all areas of our society. So what progress have you guys seen within our own industry in marketing, and what work, what more work do you think needs to be done? Um so when I started back in 2006, there were definitely not a lot of African Amer American males in this industry, media specifically, um, in agencies, uh, neither on the creative side. Um, and it was around then, maybe 2008, 2009, when agencies, you know, our, our holding companies actually started focusing on having a diversity manager, you know, on, on, uh, on staff uh, or in leadership, um, definitely, you know, widening out the diversity of their boards. I did see a concerted effort from leadership of our holding companies to, you know, be a more inclusive environment. That being said, um, there was also a lot of talk then and not a lot of action as well, um, you know, as that message started coming down. So change has been slow. Um, but, you know, that being said, my, my dad has a quote, and he always says this, that, you know, progress is a long arc, you know, and, and even though, you know, things don't happen you know, night and day immediately, you're changing behaviors, you're changing minds, and for sustainable change, that needs to happen over time for people to come to that realization themselves. Um, so there definitely is a lot more work to be done. Um, certainly, you know, more diverse women when it comes to boards, uh, when it comes to leadership roles, um, and uh, and and also, you know, still we have an African American male shortage in this industry. Um, but you know, I do see changes, you know, which is good, uh, and um, and there's, there's just more to go. Always more to go. And what can be done? I mean, what advice would you give to help to, um, you know, bring more diversity and inclusion, especially for African American males, yeah. into the mix? I mean, just lean on, you know, empathy and experience. Um, 
And what I mean by empathy is that, you know, no one has a cookie cutter, you know, way to get somewhere. Like I got into, I got into advertising because I wanted to be a television producer and I was doing market research and just kind of fell into doing digital media buying. Right. I had, I didn't, you know, go to, you know, college for marketing, you know, I went for video television business. And so that was an unorthodox path to get to where, you know, I am today. And so, you know, when you look at someone's career, when you look at their background, you need to take everything into context, you know, on the resume. And then when you talk to them, you know, a lot of times uh, folks, you know, have uh, a way of, what is it? Like, a, people might not present themselves in a way that fits into your image of, you know, this is the kind of person I want to work with us. And they might have a stutter from like, you know, past trauma. They might, like, who knows what their background is. As long as you can be, you know, empathetic and and also very open minded about someone's experience and what they can bring to the table from their character is the most important thing. That's how you really start to diversify, you know, your workforce um, is really focusing more on the character than what's on the resume. Yeah, that's awesome. And from a process perspective, do you do, do you have anything like internally within your own company or um, just in general in other organizations you've worked in where maybe it's like, I've seen like hiring committees. I think Facebook does a good job of this where like even the hiring manager doesn't necessarily have uh, the authority to, to necessarily make the decision because it's uh, done by committee and the committee is really diverse. Like, are there things from a kind of a hiring process perspective that you've seen that have been successful? From RB, not to my knowledge of anything top down like that. Uh, for us as a global company, we are already just diverse because we're in every country and we do a lot of cross pollination between countries. Um, a lot of it, like on a monthly basis, there's just new people coming to the office from different countries and stuff, very diverse crew. And I think that just by that ethos, we are, uh, it's just in our DNA to hire diverse. Um, like when you walk into the Jersey office, like it's like the Rainbow Coalition is beautiful. Uh, and, and, uh, and it's made us a strong company in that regard. Um, so there's no real like top down, at least as far as I know, like mandate to the HR team or even to the hiring because I've hired a few people at RB. Um, it's just more a practice of ours that's just in our DNA. That's even better. Yeah. <laughs> Lauren, what about on your end? Yeah, what I can speak to is more um, because it is such a long evolution um, to my experience with Nestle that I was with for the majority of my career. Um, I definitely saw practices there uh, being diverse in the types of schools that they hired from. Um, I think that's obviously if you're if you're going to schools and those schools are sort of pre-selecting the type of students they want to have, you're you're going to end up with the same exact person over and over again. So really diversifying sort of where you're looking for hiring and creating. Um, communities within your organization that are accepting and and that people can come in and feel that they have allies within the organization, I think is really important as well. And I think that goes across every type of diversity. I remember early on at Nestle, we even did like a Myers-Briggs test where the entire marketing organization was on the same exact square. And, and that's concerning on some level, right? Like, you know what I mean? It's like, how are you representing all of America when you all think the same way, you know? Right. And it, I, that's obviously a really different, but on, on the um, diversity, and I, I think it does take time. We see so many, we'll be in meetings oftentimes where there's so many women in the meeting, but then you go to a leadership meeting and you don't see that, that same diversity at all. Sometimes you're the only woman. And I think that um, that is the piece in all of these things that takes time, that to bring the people into the organization takes time, to bring them up in the organization takes time. But if you're not focused on it, it's, it's never gonna happen. And so it's not to say we shouldn't be doing it, and, and that it takes time as an excuse by any means, that's not what I'm saying, but I think in seeing the results, that's the part that, that does. But I mean, both Ferrero and Nestle are also very global mm -hmm. and they do have, you know, operations in every market. Um, there's a big transfer of uh, 
employees around the globe. And so I do think that's an organic way, um, but I think it still needs to be a process to yeah. affect the change that I think we'd like to see. Sure, makes sense. All right, guys, I think we're gonna go into some Q&A from the audience. Uh, so there's a question here for you, Lauren. How important is Amazon and Walmart.com to the success of Ferrera's business today? And what have been your biggest challenges scaling e-commerce growth? Okay, um, how important they are, obviously from a growth standpoint, hugely important. Um, today, over 90% of purchase still happens in store. So we are not a product that is primarily an online purchase. So if we look at what's driving the bulk of our business today, it's, it's in-store purchase. If we look at the future and, and the numbers keep shifting, but we're gonna be at that 80, 20 point much sooner than we think, and then it's gonna continue to evolve from there. I think a huge challenge for us, honestly, is having a product that melts. And so, you know, and I don't even get into climate discussion, but we have more and more months that are considered hot months, especially in certain parts of our country, and the cost to ship a ref refrigerated pretty much prices us out in a lot of cases. So when we look at a summer ship program or a summer sampling program, that's a big challenge for us. And so figuring out back to supply chain, um, how to do that cost effectively is, is truthfully like the piece that will be needed in order to really expand chocolate shipments. Got it. And are you shipping, can you purchase pro the, these products online right now? Yes, um, you definitely can purchase the products online. In the past, we actually had gone dark during the summer months. And we have done testing with Amazon as well as with walmart.com on fulfilling a kind of re refrigerated type pack. But as it stands now with the current pricing, that's, that's a big challenge. Um, and, it, and it messes with the algor algorithms, right? If you go dark for a period and then you come back, and especially if you think of what we're coming back to being Halloween, mm -hmm. it's really critical that summer is, is a key part of your business. So that is a real piece that we need to figure out in order to um, be able to see the growth that we'd like to see in the future. Makes sense. And Nobles, I, the question actually does apply to your brand as well. I mean, what are your thoughts on this? Same thing, uh, you know, 95% of our sales comes from brick and mortar retail. Um, so I think maybe we've seen a bump to about 8% for e-commerce now with COVID. There's no way this is stopping though. It's gonna continue to grow. But we're still very much focused on, you know, in in store purchases. Um, but again, every day is different. So we're going to see how this is going to evolve through the course of this year. Um, but yeah, that's kind of same same boat as Lauren. Just not with the heat. We, that doesn't really affect our business. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you'll figure it out first. <laughs> yeah. I know. I've been trying to buy a lot of Lysol online. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> When you can get it for sure. Yes. Right? <laughs> exactly. Um, how has your leadership style changed over the past few months? Of course, we're adjusting to very, very new realities. Um, have you been able to develop uh, more personal relationships with your colleagues? Um, I guess I'll take that one. I, again, I'm, I'm a Gemini. So no matter who I talk to, I get just, I just throw my heart on the table. I'm like, here. And that's, I, I develop personal relationships with almost anyone I talk to. Um, and so, you know, for, for my team of, of agency folks and colleagues, uh, like they're going to hear from me almost every day and, and not necessarily only for business. Like I do like to call, do check-ins and stuff, make sure people are good. Um, I don't always turn my video on, to be honest, especially for the last few days where I've just been kind of downtrodden, but, uh, but I really do make an effort to make a personal connection, uh, with everyone that I talk to through the course of the day. Um, by turning on that video, by just calling and checking in and, you know, talking about things outside of work. Um, you know, I text a lot now with my agencies. So I've never done that before. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it, it, and I also, you know, provide parameters too, where it's like, look, like off the bat, if I won't be sending you texts past six o'clock. Um, but if you do want to text me and you just want to talk about something, you know, I'm always open for them. Don't worry about time. And, uh, and it's really created a really interesting, like, uh, integrated agency dynamic uh, that it's not just top down like 
me to them um, as much as it might have used to be in the past. They're starting to talk more amongst themselves. And so we made this whole entire new community of our partners together, which has been extremely good for our business um, and also good for morale across the board. Beautiful. That's awesome. I think I will echo that, that I would say the majority of our calls that are lengthy all day are not video. And I do think that element has a little bit of a dehumanizing, you know, what all of a sudden will be on and it's generally with the agency's call and everyone's face is there and it's like, oh my gosh, people, you know, and then yet we go back to these calls where it's just dark. So I do think that that's a takeaway for sure is that if this is going to continue, I think it's worth the effort to try to have those, those video connects when you can, because I think it does keep you more present. Um, which is important, right? And um, so that's one thing. I do agree on the texting. Um, there's so much more texting, and I think the positive of that is there's much more of this, like, connection. I think the watch out there is that it does extend to all hours. And, you know, I work for a company that's on the East Coast. Our agencies, you know, are primarily East Coast or Central. And so I have to be mindful that, you know, six o'clock isn't, for me, isn't six o'clock for them. And sometimes I will get a text from them and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, like, this is so late. And so I think that, sorry, the, um, the bounds of what a work day is are kind of creeping, you know, and, <laughs> and that I think we need to help hold those boundaries with, with um, you know, I think we have that as a job to do. That's a very good point, Lauren. Yeah, totally agree with that. Um, oh, for, for Nobles, do you see influencers playing a role in the new way that you are marketing, especially for Lysol with distribution still being an obstacle? Oh, thank you for the question, Jessica. I love you. Um, yeah, <laughs> like influencers are going to be extremely key for us, extremely key for all of my brands. Again, so I'm on Lysol, Airwick, Finish, Resolve, Woolite, Decon, Ridex. All of these will certainly be working with influencers as we move forward. For many different reasons. First and foremost, you know, God knows if, if there's a second wave where we don't even get out of this first wave of COVID, influencers are the only ones doing any kind of live shoots, first and foremost, off of that. Secondly, um, you know, people are on social media more now. And, and that is, you know, that's gonna obviously means that there's more places to connect with, you know, the influencers audience. Um, so yeah, we will definitely be working with influencers. I would say the way that our business is gonna change with them is that we're going to be a lot more discerning on authenticity of the influencer. We want to definitely make sure and do our due diligence in vetting them in the future that they're definitely not opportunists, that they have a true engaging audience that is, you know, really listening to them and interacting with them and, you know, not bots or anything to that matter. Um, so we're going to be very, we're going to be much more thorough in our vetting of influencers, uh, you know, going forward and also making, you know, and, and to make sure they're actually valuable to, to their audience in terms of what they have to say. And also our briefing process is going to change too. Um, we're, I'm going to start to give influencers a lot more leeway and a, and a seat at the table when it comes to the creative for that authenticity to do a better job at coming through in this new you know, world of conversation. Because it happens so fast, the world around us, that I can't brief you every day on what's going on. I have to trust the talent to a certain extent to be able to you know, adapt to what's going on at the moment they're making that content and getting it out as soon as possible so we're still relevant and authentic. Awesome, yeah, super, super great. And I totally agree. I mean, influencers are a decentralized creative network and it's very, uh, very important to have that keep as an extension of your marketing team right now. Awesome, so I think we are wrapping. Um, hey, David. Hey, thank you guys so much. This was wonderful. Uh, I'm sorry we can't let you keep going, uh, but we'll hopefully have you back for round two. This was this was really great, and and, and I said, uh, you know, we do appreciate you uh, taking the time out of your day, and especially with everything going on, to to share with us and and talk to our community. So thank you so much. Thank you, David. Thank, thank you, Adrian. You. Of thank course. You, Adrian. All right. Take care, guys. Bye. See ya. We're going Bye. to.